In this video, we are going to be exploring the Raymond zeta function. Mathematicians have been interested in this function for hundreds of years. Not only does this function have outputs that we could talk forever about, but it also has applications in physics and encodes a lot of information concerning the location of prime numbers. The zeta function is the summation of the reciprocal of the natural numbers raised to some complex exponent s. This might sound a bit confusing. For example, if our input was s is equal to 2, the function would be the summation of 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, and so on, all the way to infinity. This function was originally only defined for when s had a real part greater than 1. However, through a method called analytical continuation, mathematicians have been able to expand the zeta function's domain for all complex values of s. While this is another topic that definitely deserves its own video, just think of this as a method used to expand the domain of a function. Back in 1650, a mathematician named Pietro Mongoli posed a problem. He wanted to know the exact value of zeta of 2. In other words, what is the exact sum of the reciprocal of the squares of all natural numbers? This was called the Basel problem. The solution eluded some of the greatest mathematicians of the time, such as the Bernoulli family, Leibniz, and John Wallace. It was not until 1736 when Leonard Euler solved the problem, giving him instant fame and recognition in the math community. So how did he solve the problem? Let's solve this problem the way that Euler did. Firstly, let's start with the Maclaurin series for sine of x. Then, for reasons that will become apparent later, let's divide both sides by x. Secondly, let's try to write sine x as the product of its roots. Starting with pi minus x times x times pi plus x, we get an alright approximation for sine x. And again, for reasons that will become apparent later, we're going to divide by x on both sides again, giving us sine x over x is approximately equal to pi minus x times pi plus x. Now we could get a much better approximation by multiplying this by some constant to give our approximation function the right amplitude. It turns out this happens at 1 over pi squared. And as we add more factors, we must keep dividing by whatever root we added. For example, if we added 2 pi minus x times 2 pi plus x, we must divide by 1 over 2 pi twice, leaving our approximated function being 1 over 4 pi to the 4th times pi minus x times pi plus x times 2 pi minus x times 2 pi plus x. More simply, we can distribute these 1 over something pi's accordingly, and we can get sine x over x is equal to 1 plus x over pi times 1 minus x over pi times 1 plus x over 2 pi times 1 minus x over 2 pi, and so on. Now, we can multiply some of these adjacent factors together, and we get a bunch of differences of perfect squares. Doing that, we'll get sine x over x is equal to 1 minus x squared over pi squared times 1 minus x squared over 4 pi squared times 1 minus x squared over 9 pi squared, and so on. And now that we've written sine x over x this way, let's just focus on what happens to the coefficient of x squared when we distribute these differences of perfect squares. Doing that, we'll get negative 1 over pi squared plus 1 over 4 pi squared plus 1 over 9 pi squared, and so on, all times x squared. Now this is starting to seem a little bit familiar. Let's start by factoring out 1 over pi squared and see where that brings us. Alright, so factoring out 1 over pi squared gives us negative 1 over pi squared times 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 and so on times x squared. Alright, now this is looking super familiar. This looks like our problem from the beginning, the sum of the reciprocal of the squares. But how does this help us though? All we have is the original problem we were trying to solve plus some other stuff. Well, let's try comparing our original Maclaurin series for sine x over x to the infinite product function for sine x over x. Well, since these two functions are equal, we can compare the coefficients of the different terms of x. Comparing the coefficient of x squared in our infinite product formula to the coefficient of x squared in the Maclaurin series, we get negative 1 over pi squared times 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 9 and so on times x squared is equal to negative 1 over 6x squared. Now, all we have to do from here is divide both sides by x squared multiply the pi squared over to the other side, divide by negative 1, and we get 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, and so on, is equal to pi squared over 6. And that is how Euler found that zeta of 2 was exactly equal to pi squared divided by 6. Now, this isn't the only thing that Euler's managed to pull from the zeta function. In addition to solving the Basel problem, he's also found a way to rewrite the zeta function as an infinite product he wrote the zeta function as an infinite product of 1 over 1 minus the reciprocal of the prime numbers raised to some complex exponent s. A much cleaner way to write an infinite product is by using a capital pi. Normally we see sigma, which represents repeated summation, whereas pi represents repeated multiplication. 
Euler's product formula is not only useful since it gives us another way to write the zeta function, but it also connects the zeta function to the prime numbers. An interesting fact about this product formula is that we can use it to determine the probability that two randomly chosen integers are relatively prime. Let's let a and b each equal a randomly selected positive integer, and we want to find the probability that they are relatively prime. And this just means that a and b don't have common factors. For instance, 15 and 8 would be relatively prime, since 15 doesn't share any of the same factors as 8. Let's just start with asking what is the probability that our numbers aren't divisible by 2? Well, since one half of all numbers are even, the probability that a or b isn't divisible by 2 would be one half. But what is the probability that both a and b aren't divisible by 2? Well, since the probability that both a and b are divisible by 2 is one half times one half, the probability that both aren't divisible by one half would be one minus one over two squared. We can see this follows the same pattern with being divisible by three, five, and so on. So we know that the probability that a and b aren't divisible by 2 is 1 minus 1 over 2 squared. But what would the probability be that a and b are not divisible by 2 or 3? Well, we would just multiply this by the probability that both a and b are not divisible by 3, carrying this on with divisibility by 5, 7, 11, and so on. When carrying this on forever, we can rewrite this as an infinite product of 1 minus 1 over p squared, where p is the prime numbers going from 2 to infinity. Now this definitely should look a bit familiar. This is actually the reciprocal of Euler's product formula for zeta function evaluated at s equals 2. And we know from earlier that zeta of 2, geniusly solved by Euler, is equal to pi squared divided by 6. The reciprocal of this would be 6 over pi squared, and thus we find that the probability of two randomly selected positive integers being relatively prime is exactly equal to 6 over pi squared. Now, before delving too much deeper into the zeta function, it's probably a good idea to understand what it even means to raise a number to a complex exponent. Let's start by raising 1 half to the power of i, where i is the square root of negative 1. To get a value for this, we need to start by rewriting 1 half to the i power as e to the power of the natural log of 1 half to the i power, which is just equal to e to the power of i times the natural log of a half. Now, using Euler's function, e to the i x equals cosine x plus i sine x, we find that e to the i ln of a half is equal to cosine ln of a half plus i sine ln of a half. The value we get for this is around 0.769 minus 0.639i. Now, this is going to be a bit confusing, but the magnitude, or distance from the origin, of cosine x plus i sine x in the complex plane is equal to 1. This means that every point on e to the x i, which is just equal to cosine x plus i sine x, lies on the unit circle in the complex plane since the unit circle is just a set of all points whose distance from the origin is 1. For a value such as 1 half to the 2 plus i, we can rewrite this as 1 half squared times 1 half to the i power. The real part, 1 half squared, is rotated to be in line with 1 half to the i power, the point that lies on the unit circle. The value of 1 half squared is not changed, its magnitude stays the same, the point is only rotated. And quick side note, if we plug in pi to Euler's formula, we actually get e to the i pi is equal to negative 1, which is pretty cool. The Riemann hypothesis concerns the Riemann zeta function and its zeros. It is known that all non-trivial zeros, trivial zeros being roots where the real part is negative even integer, of the function lie where the real part of s is between 0 and 1. It hypothesizes that all of the roots of the Riemann zeta function occur where the real part is 1 half. A lot of books and work of mathematicians are written on the assumption that the Riemann hypothesis is true, and if the hypothesis can be proven, the Clay Mathematics Institute will give the person who solves it a million dollars as a part of their Millennium Prize problems. If it turns out to be correct, mathematicians will have a better idea of how prime numbers are distributed, which is a large part of number theory. Bernard Riemann was born in 1826. He grew up in a religious family in Hanover, and initially wanted to study theology, the study of religion. Instead, when he went to the University of Göttingen to study under Karl Friedrich Gauss, he recommended that Raymond become a full-time mathematician, which Raymond decided to pursue. He transferred to the University of Berlin in 1847. Later in his life, he became the head of the mathematics department at the University of Göttingen in 1859 where he started the work on the mathematics of general relativity. Raymond died of tuberculosis in 1866 while traveling to Italy. 
If you plug in s equals negative 1 to the Riemann zeta function, the output is negative 1 12. This means that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and uh, so on adds up to negative 1 12. Of course, this makes no sense, and it shouldn't. There are other methods of adding infinite numbers and getting negative 1 12 too, and I suggest googling them since they aren't too complicated and kind of interesting. Negative 1 12 can be obtained using a summation method named after one, another one of history's best mathematicians, Srinivasa Ramu, Ramanujan. This value surprisingly has applications in string theory, a theory that our universe is made up of a bunch of strings of energy vibrating at different frequencies. The Raymond zeta function can also be used to model quantum chaos systems, which is using quantum mechanics for completely uh, random equations, which is helpful for quantum physicists. Internet encryption, another application, depends on the prime factorization of very large numbers, which many computers can't do efficiently. However, with the Raymond hypothesis stating that all prime numbers lie along the critical line, decryption would be made easier. This means that further research into the Raymond zeta function makes it necessary to improve encryption techniques and maintain internet security. Domain coloring is a method for representing complex functions, like the Raymond zeta function. It can be used to show four dimensions, utilizing color and intensity of color to do so. The method uses colors for points like showing the origin is black, one is red, negative one is cyan, and infinity is white. The reason that a four-dimensional function is necessary is because complex functions are complex-valued functions of complex variables, making them two dimensions by two dimensions, or four-dimensional. For the trinket, uh, we decided to make a board game. Um, with the board game, we, we used a graph of the function as the board. The game pieces have pictures of the math department on them showing the rival mathematicians trying to prove the Raymond hypothesis for the $1 million reward. The goal of the game is to go through the function and reach the line at s equals 1 half, shown with a finish line, thereby proving the hypothesis. Many of the spaces have actions in them, showing what you, playing as the mathematician, do next, and move on the board accordingly. We added rules like whenever you land on the same space as another person, you have to play rock, paper, scissors against them to determine who's more intelligent and the loser has to move back one space. Overall, it was a pretty fun thing to work on. Let's get into the action.